the time has come now for some concluding remarks from Ben Ford. Ben Ford is a rather important figure in the field of maritime archaeology. Don't make faces, Ben. I, I can't really see you, but I know you are. <laughs> and I think Ben's an important figure because he has, in this country, along with John Jensen, the two giants, really, if you will, with maritime cultural landscape theory and practice, taken us to a different level, where in the past we really did just talk about shipwrecks. And we argued over that and applied some theory to it but forgot the culture that was there and forgot more than just the maritime world of the Europeans being important, but indigenous maritime worlds and interactions with the environment and, of course, where people interact between land and sea. When I first met Ben, he was a student at Texas A&M, getting his degree there, coming out of a career in cultural resources management. And I was struck by the irony that here's a fellow who's brilliantly looking at maritime cultural landscapes and theories in a school that prides itself on documenting every timber off of every ship down to the nail hole, which is important in that processual way. But I think also is a reminder that as we look in our various areas, there are people like Ben and like John who take us to that next level and what it all means in the big scale of things and also at its most intimate on the human scale. Ladies and gentlemen, Ben Ford. So that's going to be hard to follow. Um, so first off, I just want to say thank you. Um, I want to thank Barbara and Val and Jim and Jimmy and Brad and Dana. Did I miss anybody that was involved? And Mike Russo, apologies, Mike, um, for, for setting this up. This has been, this has been awesome. Um, and I really appreciate just being involved at all in it. Um, and it, it's sort of a, there's a caveat to the thank you in that we'll see how appreciative I am because this is a little daunting to have to then follow up two days of which is basically a master's course in maritime cultural landscapes and try to say anything general at the end of that. Um, and it, it's doubly daunting being like the dumbest, least wise person in the room. That makes it that much harder. Um, and, and there's, cause there's folks here like, like John Jensen, like Todd, Todd, how do you say your last name? Ragey. I was wrong. Um, and, you know, who, whose stuff I've been following for years and who I'm, you know, who's, I kind of hoover up at anything that they write. And then a bunch of other folks that I've heard in the last couple days that um, I'm going to have to start reading more. Um, and, and so it's, it's really, a, this is kind of a daunting task, but I'll, I'll do what I can here. Um, the, I'm really excited about all of this. This has been really exciting. This has been really rewarding. Um, what I'm going to try and do is frame, is to sort of tamp down my, my excitement um, and frame these comments in the idea of sort of thinking about how the federal preservation process works um, and, and sort of not get sucked into like, that was cool, that was cool, that was cool, but sort of what can we do with this and, and pull some ideas that other people have talked about. Um, and, and just a little bit of, little bit of to contextualize sort of how I come at this, I, I've been playing with this idea of maritime cultural landscape um, both on the land and on the water for, a, for about a decade. Um, and I, I came to, to look at MCLs after a career in, in cultural resource management, um, and, but I was just starting an academic program, so I'm kind of, kind of bridging that, that particular divide. Um, and, and it appealed to me because it was a way to apply the skills that I had learned doing CRM to, in an academic world, right? If I was a, you know, underwater mouth breather, a shovel, uh, you know, shovel bum, ground pounder type of person. And so this was a way to use those skills but do academic type stuff because it framed it in a way that, that academics liked. Um, and, and so I, I ran across Christopher Westerdahl's 1992 article like, what, 12, 13 years after he wrote it? So, you know, kind of late to the game. And Christopher had been writing in his native language for, for what, almost a, two decades before that or so, or well, 15 years before that. So, I mean, this was a well-developed concept. And, and I just basically had some timing and latched onto the jargon of it. It's really what I, what I did. Um, and, and, and to be clear, Christopher has moved on. Like this was, the 92 article is a, is a management approach. Um, and that, that also appealed to me because I was coming, coming out of sort of a management approach to archaeology. So that management aspect of the 92 article really appealed to me. But if you read Christopher's more, more recent stuff, he has definitely moved on. So this is an evolving concept, which also sort of appealed to me because um, 
it was a way to do anthropological underwater archaeology. Um, and, you know, I love ships like a lot of people have talked about. I came out of a program where we measure and record ships. Um, I sort of agree with Dave in that they are, they're an artifact, but they are the, the most complicated artifact that any pre-industrial person made. Um, and hence, they're slightly different than a projectile point. Um, and you could argue that they're actually a site um, or a structure where it makes you happy um, because they, you know, a lot of people lived on them. Right? And so if you look at a, a submerged prehistoric site or a submerged um, pre-contact site or a submerged first-person site, um, sorry, Doug, um, old habits die hard, um, the, you know, maybe more people were on that ship than were on in that site. But regardless, there's a, there's a fetishism with, with shipwrecks in, in underwater archaeology, and this was a way to kind of break away from that. And so um, all of this really appealed to me, and that's sort of how I came, came to do this. So what I'd like to do in the next couple minutes here is sort of offer a couple things. Talk briefly about the benefits that I see in this approach. Talk about at more length about the problems that I see applying this approach within the sort of federal process um, that are not insurmountable, but problems. And, and then sort of end with maybe a couple just sort of suggestions about process or procedure that might, might be helpful as we move forward here. So in terms of benefits, um, the, this, this, this approach, this maritime cultural science approach, uh, it, it supports a whole bunch of different perspectives, right? I mean, you've got multiple cultures perspective can be lo locked into this. You've got uh, multiple theoretical perspectives can be put into this. So phenomenology, practice theory, Marxist theory, uh, cultural ecology, whatever makes you happy, you can do it within this, this framework. And I think importantly, you can bring in a management perspective as well. And so it's got a lot of, it's a broad church. And so it's got a lot of, a lot of parts we could pull in here. And to be honest, I think the fact that we can, can bring a lot of different publics in, a lot of different scholars in, is really helpful because um, you know, the scholarship we do today is grounded in the, the beliefs of today, what people want today, uh, how people see the environment today. And so there's a, there's a grounding in today that's important, but there's also the, the things that we study, the things that we choose to study, influences what people in the future see as important. And so there's sort of this recursive relationship between you know, the public and academics, the public and scholars that, that is, you know, grounded in today but hopefully building towards, towards the future. And so I think that's, that's, that's key here. And the, the uh, theoretical perspectives, you know, we talked a lot of, there's a lot of theory sort of in the last couple of days, is helpful because that frames those questions, right? It goes, take theory to what takes things from being cool old stuff to being something people care about, right? That's how you frame the argument, how you tell the story, what the, the context is, is what makes it sort of, makes it actually an interesting and worthwhile story. So I think we need, we need all these different approaches coming in, and I think that's part of what makes this a strong thing. What also makes it a strong, to me at least makes it a strong approach, is that um, space is what we all share, right? Um, cultures come and go, people come and go, but the space is there. The space is always there. The place is always there. Um, and so, the, you know, I may see it one way, somebody else may see it differently, but we, we're seeing the same physical place. And I think that, that gives us a little bit of strength. It binds us all together. It gives us some commonality that, um, that we can build on, some commonality that sort of gives us um, multiple constituencies, right? Because if you're doing preservation, building constituencies is important. The more people who care about something, the easier it is to argue to preserve it. The more people who have your back when it's time to, to preserve something. And so we can bring more people in and we all share this one thing. I think that, that's a strength. Um, and and the, the, the place itself has these characteristics, right? And those characteristics help link us today with our forebears. You know, they, sa they sat there and they looked at the ice and saw the ice come in. They saw the clouds, they had the waves, they heard the waves. Um, they experienced that place in, in very much the same way that we can experience. At least the, the physical components were, were all there. And so I think there's a, there's a, there's a strong way to, to link today and, and the past together with sort of a, a place-based, landscape-based approach. Um, and, and there's also a physicality to this, right? And the physicality is what makes archaeology somewhat different than history, right? The fact that I can hand a student an artifact and say, this is 10,000 years old, and they go, whoa, right? And if I can go to a place and say, this place has been important for 15,000 years, that's, that's, there's something to be said for that. Um, and so the, the physicality of it, the fact that there's a, there's a physical linkage between then and now and then moving into the future, um, I think all really sort of argue for this as an approach. I also like it because I'm from Ohio. Like, I'm a working class kid from a landlocked state. Um, I'm a landsman. 
All right? I mean, I'm like, that's, that's where I grew up. My people don't necessarily trust the water. Um, and so, uh, yeah. Uh, and so this is a, this, this approach lets us draw landsmen in, right? It's, it moves beyond swimmers and divers and boaters and kayakers um, because parts of the, the maritime cultural landscape do go up on land or pushes the water back um, away from land, right? And so it, this is a way to pull in a lo much larger, larger population. Um, and it, it is important to view the landscape from the water. That's an important perspective to have, but we can also pull in pull in lands people. So again, it lets us build this larger constituency. And I think, again, building that constituency is really important to any sort of preservation. And, and sort of finally along those lines, the maritime cultural landscape approach allows us to build linkages um, to the built environment, to the buildings people's, right, um, to, through archaeology, through traditional cultural um, places or, or, or properties, um, and I think importantly to ecology. Right, and, and ecology, right, is the, the idea that humans are an animal and we're operating in, in, in the environment and we affect the environment like any other animal does, right? And so ecology lets us bring in environmental protection. And people like old stuff, but they really like having clean water and livable, livable environments. And so I think this is, again, because it's place-based, because it ties into sort of human-environment interaction, um, this, this, this sort of approach allows us to, to build an ever larger constituency. And ultimately, I take a very pragmatic approach to this. I don't really care why you agree with me. I just want you to agree with me, right? So if, we're all, if we all are agreeing that this is important, I don't really give a shit why you think it's important. I just want to, just want to take care of it. Um, and so that's a, I think that's, a, that's, that's important here because basically water links the world, right? Um, and if, if you want to do it from a sort of a cultural perspective, it's, you know, through all kinds of transportation. So up into the modern era, that's how we got around, was mostly by, by water. Um, but more importantly, it's key to life. Right? I mean, it's, it's a resource that's important to everybody. Um, and so how we deal with water, how we protect water, I, I think is a universal. And so again, we can build this large constituency to then argue for preservation. And we want to preserve old stuff, but that's, that's one form of preservation. Um, and, and then so sort of along the, the ideas here of, of just one more sort of reason why this is, this is helpful is that it, um, it allows for broader interpretation. Right? It, it allows for synthesis. It allows us to look across time, across space, to, to ask larger questions, to ask, you know, to basically this whole big data thing, like NSF loves big data, everybody talks about big data these days. This is big data, right? I mean, this is, we're looking big areas, long periods of time, and, um, you know, and, and, and through space and time, basically, so ran out of dimensions there. Um, but, I mean, it's a, it's, it's, a big, it's a big set of data to pull from, and we can make some really interesting comparisons and simulation synthesis, and actually maybe ask some questions that, that matter, and that's really why, I read your stuff, Todd, because you talk about stuff that matters, and so I think that's, that's helpful. Um, and, and so just to sort of wrap this up here, or at least the, the positive side, and then I'll switch to the, the hard part. Um, it's a powerful tool. It's got a broad church. Um, it, it's, it's a good way to, 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 um, to look at the world, but I don't think it, it's, it's unproblematic within the National Register of Historic Places framework. Um, so the, I see a couple of problems. I see boundaries, because that come up a couple of times as a problem. And, and Hans raised the question of, you know, when does it stop being maritime? And to me, that's relatively easy. Um, this is a little bit trite, but um, Homer answers this, right? Homer basically, I'm gonna, Homer says it better than I do because he's, he's Homer, um, right? But you take, take a paddle and walk inland, and when it stops being a paddle and becomes a threshing paddle, um, or take an oar and walk inland, and it stops being an oar becomes a threshing paddle, it stops being maritime somewhere around there, right? Where the, the, the use of it changes, the, the, the perception of it changes, that's that line. So to me, that's relatively straightforward. Um, the issue of scale and boundaries, though, I find less straightforward. Um, it, you know, the modern, the, the modern world's connected. Right? And we, we saw, um, you know, with, with Matt Sanger's talk earlier that the ancient world is connected um, and, and pretty, pretty largely connected. And then when you add in European invasion and expansion, then everything is connected, certainly in the 1600s. And so that, you, you could draw a maritime landscape that's global. Um, and there's, there's some, some use in that. But I think we need to draw the line somewhere maybe smaller than that. Um, if we draw it too small, we lose the power of landscape, we lose the power to connect. But if we draw it too big, I'm afraid that we're going to tip sort of people's tenuous meter. Like there, there's, a, there's a tenuous threshold for folks. Um, we, I call it the bullshit meter, right? Um, and we're going to peg that over if we make this too big because it, it becomes cold to people. It becomes too much of a grab to folks. I'm, I'm afraid. This is, my, this is my concern. I don't know if this is 
true or not, but it's my concern. Um, and, and so we, we, we need to find somewhere sort of, sort of in, in between, and, and that, that I don't have a good answer for, but I think settling on, on some idea about how to define scale and boundary is gonna be, gonna be important. I think more troubling to me in terms of boundaries, though, is that a lot of times maritime cultural landscapes involve things that move. Right? I mean, they're, they're fluid in the most literal sense. Um, so the water comes through, right? That's obvious. But like sediments come through, so there's, there's you know, shore drift and all that kind of stuff happening, which can change the landscape. Um, the critters come through, right? So animals, um, you know, fish and, and birds, which very much might be very much part of that landscape, part of why it's important. They're gonna, they, they transit through here, right? And which is gonna be an issue, I think, from a management perspective, because if that's an important part of that landscape and we try to draw a boundary around it, we, we can't manage the critters because they're outside of the boundary. And so it I think that becomes, there's some, there's some issues there that we're gonna have to, um, to probably grapple with. I also am afraid there may be some jurisdictional issues uh, in that maritime landscapes don't have to cross the waterline, but a lot of them might, which means that they're possibly going to move from you know private to state, to federal jurisdictions. Um, and if everybody can play nice, that's awesome. But I, in my experience, that doesn't always work. Um, and so I, I have some concerns that the, the nature of, of crossing the waterline and what that does in terms of, 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 of jurisdiction and ownership um, might, cause, might cause some issues that we're gonna have to again, kind of gr grapple with. Not insurmountable, but something to be, I'm, I, I worry about. Um, and, and just sort of more broadly, um, I like the maritime cultural landscape approach because it breaks down boundaries. It gets rid of that prehistoric historic line. Like I mean, like you said, it's insulting and kind of pointless um, because it, it, it there's there's people in before and there's people after, and you know they all have different ways of keeping track of history. And so we can get rid of that and we can just track use of that landscape right on through. Um, it's a good way to dissolve um, political boundaries, right? Because people in the past transited state lines by water and didn't really care. Where I worked, they went back and forth across the international line like it didn't matter, because um, it didn't matter really. Um, and, and so, you know, there's we can we can dissolve a lot of a lot of boundaries. And we can even dissolve the waterline boundary because the waterline has has moved, and there's resources on both sides that um, were created by the same people. Right? If you're a maritime person, you left stuff in the water, left stuff on land. Same person dropped it. So, I mean, we can we can dissolve a lot of boundaries with this, but. Um, the National Register of Historic Places needs boundaries, right? And so, I think I think just in general, bounding is going to be is going to be something we're going to have to figure figure out how to deal with. Um, the the other thing I think that I want to point out is that most of the talks in the last couple of days focused on what I would consider one facet of a larger maritime cultural landscape. So we talked about um, you know, first peoples sites that are submerged, or we talked about you know, a, 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 a group of shipwrecks. We talked about um, a, a bunch of canoes. We talked about a, a lot of different stuff. But to me, those are all part of a, of a maritime cultural landscape. The landscape would be the space and the human use of that space through time. And, and what that's gonna result in is multiple property types. That's, that's not, we're not gonna be able to define it as one property type. We're gonna have to, to work across um, a huge swath of things, right? Because it could be, um, you know, first people's sites that are underwater and on land, in addition to shipwrecks, in addition to port features and, and shoreline features, um, in addition to how people perceive the surface of the water, in addition to where I believe that Paul Bunyan drug his toe, right? Because um, I'm from the Midwest, so he's our, he's our culture hero. Um, but I mean, you know, all of that is valid. All of that is part of this, this, um, this, this story, and that's a lot of different types of resources that we're gonna have to, Sort of, sort of deal with. And I think there's a strength there because they're all linked by this tie to the place. And they, they link a bunch of different people together. So it's a strong thing, but it also means that we're gonna have to deal with, you know, archeological sites and districts and buildings and structures um, and traditional cultural properties and a lot of other stuff that are all gonna overlap. And so I think in terms of managing that, that's gonna take a little bit of, a little bit of dealing with. And there's gonna be a lot of different types of integrity there, right? Um, and I would argue that actually we should think about landscapes from the archeological integrity sort of approach. You know, it's, like, it's not gonna look like it did when the person who lived there lived there. Because landscapes change. Landscapes are part nature. Nature by its very nature changes. Um, trees grow back.
things come and go, things erode in the water sense. Um, you know, there, there's, there's a shift there. And people keep coming back to that same place. And that's what makes it an interesting landscape is that recurring use of it. But, you know, there's this, this idea that landscape is the unwitting biography, right, um, which I think is a nice way to describe it. But the other way to think about that is that biography has been erased and rewritten, erased and rewritten many, many times. And so we're, it's going to be, it's going to be different. Or to put this in archaeological terms, site formation processes are constantly at work on a landscape, both cultural and natural site formation processes. For my professional friends, we're talking about C transforms and N transforms, right? Um, and so that's, that's going to be happening, and we're going to have, that's, so I think the archaeological level of integrity is what we should be looking at in terms of thinking about integrity for these things. This is, again, just my opinion. Um, so, so in dealing with this, um, I have a couple of just suggestions, and I'll, and I'll quit. Um, we shouldn't get wrapped up in the jargon, okay? Uh, if, if there's an existing approach, we should use it. So I, I think um, Ms. Blanco um, made this point that, you know, if, if, there's a, if districts work for you, then use districts. If, if it's, you can call it a site, call it a site. Um, if it's a traditional cultural property, call it that. Work within the existing form. If that's, if that, because I think that'll make life easier. Um, also, I don't think we should get hung up on the idea of maritime cultural landscape as a term. Um, personally, le cultural landscape to me is a little bit redundant. Um, landscapes are cultural. If there's no people involved, no culture involved, that's the environment. Um, and <laughs> it's, it's doing fine without us, basically, right? Um, so, so I think, you know, we could call it, and then we're down to maritime. Um, and maritime, to me, is a modifier of landscape. And so I think we could talk about a lot of stuff just in terms of, of a landscape. And I understand that it's troubling to some folks, especially those of us who, who like and work on the water, the idea that land, right? That's sort of like woman versus, um, versus man, right? That sort of by modifying it with, with a term, it sort of become, you, you give, you give um, more, more power to one side of it. So, you know, if we want to call them scapes, if that makes people happy, that's, that's fine. I actually sort of like, um, the, the cultural landscape approach terminology, the CLA, in part because it's an active term. It talks about an approach. And so I think there's, there's some, some value in, in that. Um, and that's, I'm, I'm, cr I'm cribbing from, um, from Brad's paper that we, we, that we suggested reading. He talked about the CLA um, approach. And so I think, you know, that's a good, I, I don't think we should get hung up on the terminology, basically, is what I'm, what I'm driving at. Um, and the, the caveat there, though, is the maritime cultural landscape idea might still be useful though, right? So use something that already exists, don't get hung up on the, on the language, but if there are places that are really important and places that cr cut, cut across a lot of the existing ways that we deal with cultural resources, so their TCPs and their archaeological sites and their districts, and it's all sort of bedded together, then maybe this term becomes useful in that sense. And so I think there's something along, along those lines. I think we often think about our goals. If our goal is, is interpretation and education, then um, I think there's existing things to work with, right? There's the, the, the heritage areas, these big swaths of the continent that, we, that we, we use for education and interpretation. The marine sanctuaries are awesome for this. Um, national parks do this, right? And so if that's our goal, then I think we should run with that. If our goal is more broad-based um, management and preservation, then we're kind of back to the National Register of Historic Places, because that's our, our main tool for this. And that's going to then require us to think about issues of integrity, boundaries and um, significance. And like I said, the, the boundaries have troubled me. The integrity, I think, is, should be archaeological. Significance, I'm not too worried about. I think we can make a pretty strong argument for a lot of things uh, under you know, A or D. Um, and so I think that that's, that's not so bad. Um, and then the, the, the last thing I'd end with is just an idea about procedure. And I was thrilled to hear Ola talk about NEPA. I actually was surprised we didn't hear about NEPA earlier. Because to me, NEPA is one way to go about this. And NEPA doesn't really provide protection, but at least it's, it's a mindset in terms of, you know, humans in the environment. The environment is important. Both the air you breathe and the things that feed your soul, that's all environment. And so I think that that's one way to think about this. And I like NEPA because NEPA talks about consultation. It's part of the scoping process. And so, and like real consultation, like, um, you know, discussions among equal type, converse, type, type consultation. And so I think NEPA is one way to sort of conceive of this if we're moving forward with this. Um, I think we should also use the existing 
laws that are out there and just the formats that are out there. So, you know, um, like when, when John Jensen was talking about they're using the world landscape approach, I think that's one way to sort of conceive of this. Um, you know, uh, Breeden, uh, your, um, your idea with this sort of the, 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 the matrix approach, um, Susan Dolan's, you know, sort of landscape characterization, all that stuff is existing. I think that we should draw on that. And then the last thing I'll, I'll add is the, the English heritage has this idea of what they call characterization. Right? And, and, and I really think characterization is not a bad way to think about landscapes. Because landscapes, like I said, they're going to change. And what characterization does with their approach is, is they go in and it's designed for large areas. And you determine through consultation and through study what, what are the characters of that place. What is absolutely critical and should not change? What is a character of it that's, that's, that's fluid and should be allowed to change? And what do we not worry about too much? Um, and this is a way to sort of think about, about landscapes and about you know, preserving these places, but preserving what matters about them. And, and, um, um, and it, it, it keeps them vibrant because it allows them to change because it doesn't, doesn't ossify them. Um, and I, you know, it doesn't lock them in, right? It doesn't make them a museum piece. It lets them breathe and lets them continue to be a landscape. Um, but it also allows us to manage what's important. So from a maritime perspective, like fishing, if traditional fishing or uh, traditional people using it for fishing is important, then we let that we, we keep that as a, as a use of it. But they're allowed to fish it however they want, right? They're, as long as they continue to use it, because their use their use of fishing it has, has changed over time. For us to to lock it at now or to try to push it back doesn't make sense. So we, we look at what the character of the thing, what is what what sort of helps define it, and then we um, we try to preserve that which defines it without locking it in. I think this makes it easier to manage. There's less to manage. And it makes an easier sell to people, right? Because you're not trying to tell them that they can't do things. You're telling them, keep doing what you're doing. Um, we like that, right? And, there, and so it's, I think it's a way to, to, to make management easier. And, that, and this is a little bit outside of, of how we do things in the U.S., but I think it's a, a model to at least think about. So sorry, that was a little longer than I intended.